brings spiritual or kingdom release. So as an act of faith in the shift, believe and have faith that God is shifting us, that he's moving us, that he's changing us, he's transforming us, he's moving from moving us from one place, phase, position, status to a higher place, change, position, status. And we have to do that by faith. Right? In, the New, in the Old Testament, you read where Moses is holding his arms up. And as long as he held his arms up, Israel would win the battle. But when his arms got tired and uh, he let them down, they would lose the battle. But as long as his arms were up, they would win. And so there's a relationship between natural obedience and kingdom release. In the New Testament, Jesus says to the lepers, go show yourselves to the priest. As they go show themselves to the priest, they are healed. Because natural obedience brings spiritual kingdom release into our lives. So the shift that we made is an act of obedience that brings spiritual release. And so that's what I want to spend time this morning talking about, the understanding of the shift that's taking place in your life and our lives corporately. I have a, several scriptures that I want to look at to bring us to, a, uh, I guess, an a, a, a even clarity about what I'm talking about. Let's start in a good place, I think. Um, this is Ecclesiastes. We may all be familiar with this. Uh, chapter 3, verse 1. For everything there is a season, a time for every activity under, the, under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to harvest, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to cry and a time to laugh, a time to grieve and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace, and a time to turn away, a time to search, and a time to quit searching, a time to keep, and a time to throw away, a time to fear, and a time to mend, a time to be quiet, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. All I want to show you is that there is a time for everything. There is a season for everything that God operates in times and seasons. I don't know if you remember a couple of weeks ago, I talked about recognizing faith. And in that message, I talked to you about the Syrophoenician woman, woman whose daughter was being um, demonized by a, a demon and, and, and she was demon-possessed. And because she wasn't part of uh, the Jewish people, Jesus said to her, I can't, I can't really do anything for you because right now the blessings are only for the Jewish people. That, that there is a coming season where I can bless those that are not part of the Jewish culture, the covenant that that the Jewish people had with God. And then and Jesus said to us, I can't give the, the children's bread to dogs. And then she said, but even the dogs have access to the crumbs that the children have on the table. And in that, he recognized her faith and said to her, your daughter will be healed. Right? Well, that season was not prepared for her. It was a different season, but she was able to pull out of season something that was reserved for a different season. 
Remember that message. <laughs> it's okay if you don't. I'm just, making, I'm just making my point. God operates in times and seasons. And that there are actually times where we can pull from something that's reserved for a different season. But generally, that door had been closed to her. And because God recognized her faith, he opened it, and she got her healing. Okay? Let's look at um, Philippians chapter 3. Oh, before we do that, let's look at Revelation. Verse 3, chapter, cha Revelation 3, verse 7. It says, write this letter to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. This is the message from the one who is holy and true. That's Jesus. The one who has the key of David. What he opens, no one can close. And what he closes, no one can open. God opens doors and he closes doors. And these doors being opened and closed represents shift in season. And we in our lives have to recognize when a door has been closed and when a door has been opened. And if we don't recognize that, we'll miss what Jesus, what God is wanting to do in and through us and for us. Because we're out of season. You, you're with me. We, we are out of season if we don't recognize what the shift is and that he's made a shift. And we have to shift with him. And I, I feel like God has for us opened some doors and closed some doors. Maybe it's a job. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a this. Maybe it's a that. Remember, natural things, obedience to natural things, give way to kingdom release. So when we align ourselves with the shift, then it, it, it positions us for God to open up to us the, not the um, kingdom thing that he wants to do in our lives. But we've got to be in season. We've got to be in alignment with, with the shift. And I'm going to give you a, a good example of this later. I'm, I'm still trying to make the case that, that God move, he shifts us. It's, it's not business as usual. And I, I know sometimes we don't, uh, Charles talked about letting go in his opening. I know sometimes we don't, have to, we don't like to let go of things that were in our past. But in, in order to move forward to our future, we've got to let go of some things in our past. It doesn't mean that those things were bad. Maybe, maybe they were. But even good things we have to let go of because God's got better things. And the thing that we drag in an out of season that, that was in season, now into what's out of season, smell like worms, right? Remember, remember, remember God said to the Israelites, he said, hey, I'm going to give you manna every day. You don't have to store it up. And if you do store it up, it's going gonna, it's gonna to have maggots in it, it's going to stink, and it's going to smell. And I think if we're not careful, we will try to store up things that were for a previous season that are no longer relevant to this season, and they smell. Because God's not in it. He was, but he's not anymore. And so our understanding about the shift is vital because we, we want to be where he is. We want to be in a situation where uh, we are aligned with him to get the best that he has to give us.
Okay, let's look at Philippians. Chapter 3, starting in verse 10. This is Paul writing to the church in Philippi. He says, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, Woo, sharing in his death, so that one way or another I will experience the resurrection from the dead. I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. The one thing that I got to do is I got to forget my past and press on to that that's calling me, that I'm drawn to, meaning Christ. And what Paul is saying, I can't do both. I, I, can't, I can't hold on to the past and lay hold of my future. And we've got to be willing to let our past go. The good, the bad, the ugly. Because there's a shift in season. Without letting go of the past, we miss what God wants to bring us into. We miss it. And then we end up trying to give life to something that's in a previous season. And it's dead. That the thing is dead because God's closed the door on it. And he's moved on. And if we're not careful, we'll find ourselves trying to resuscitate that thing. Because at the time, it was great. It was wonderful. It was good. But today, God's moved on from it. And we have to as well. Remember, we, know all, we all know the story about David and Goliath. David had this slingshot. And at the time, Saul, King Saul, gave David his armor that included a sword. David put on the armor, and he said to himself, I can't go in these. I can't go and fight Goliath in this armor because I'm not used to it. So he took the armor off. He got four stone, or five stones, loaded them up, and got a slingshot out. Hit Goliath upside the head with the rock and his sling. You fast forward that story. He's on the run from Saul. Saul's trying to kill him. And then he goes to a place and he asks the priest, do you have a sword? I need a sword. Do you have a sword? And the priest tells him, yeah, we've got the sword that you killed Goliath with. And David says, can I have it? Notice the great thing that he did with the sling was no longer relevant when he needed a sword. He, he obviously learned how to use a sword and needed the sword. The days of, this, of him slinging were over. Those days were over. And we've got to recognize when God no longer has us slinging, but has us sorting. And if we don't, we'll go into a fight, slinging, and the enemy will take us out because we should be sorting. 
Do, do you see what I'm saying? But it's the shift in season where David had to put away the slingshot and learn how to use the sword and learn how to use the armor. Forgetting the past. The sling was a wonderful thing. It was a great thing God used to bring about his purpose with a slingshot. But that was then and this is now. And here's the thing. Here's the, here's the test, I believe, for us. The test is, are we, going to trust, are we going to put our trust in God or are we going to put our trust in the sling? And I think sometimes we put our trust in the sling and not God. And we move on, and what we realize, that God's not in the sling anymore. He's, he's moved on from the sling, and he's expecting us to learn how to use the sword now. Because there's a shift in season. You've got to learn how to use the sword, dude. And I feel like God is saying, we have to learn how to use the sword. Because there's a shift in season. Isaiah 43, verse 16. This is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters who drew out the chariots and horses, the army of reinforcements together, and they lay there never to rise again. He's talking about when Israel came out of Egypt through the Red Sea and God killed Pharaoh and the Egyptians in the Red Sea. And they lay there never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Verse 18 says, forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Forget the things of the past. I'm doing a new thing. It springs up. Do you perceive it? Here's what God says. Do you have a sense that there is a shift that's happening in your life? There's a shift that's going on in your life right now. Do you perceive that, that that's happened, that there's been a shift? It springs up. Do you perceive it? That's the question. That's the question. The question is, do we perceive that there's been a shift in our lives? Sometimes we can recognize the spiritual shift by the physical circumstances that have changed. Maybe God downloaded something to us, and we feel it in our spirit. We feel it in our heart. Maybe there was a situation or a circumstance that, 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 that's like, hmm, this, something's up with this thing that's happened in my life. It can be ever so subtle, or it can be very demonstrative. E either way, it's speaking, and God is saying there's a shift that's, got, that's happening. There's a shift in season. Don't, don't be stuck, despite how good it was, in the past. The Bible says the mercies of God are they're new every day. We, 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 don't have to, we don't have to hold on to, 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 to the blessings that he did for us. He's got new things for us every single day because he's a good God and there's no bottom to it. Do you perceive the shift? 
You know, it's easy. Uh, when I was, when I worked at the university, every time I got a promotion and I moved offices, one of the things that I would do is I would paint the office. Some, some, I, would, I would just change the paint, maybe a wall. I would rearrange the furniture, not because it needed painting, not because the office looked better, but the existing staff needed to have a perception that there was a shift, that they had a new boss, that there was a new sheriff in town. So when they walked in the office, the first thing that they would say, oh, you painted. Oh, you rearranged the furniture. That was code for the new person is here. And it's not business as usual. And I needed them to recognize that there was a shift in season. So I, I did something in the natural so that they could perceive in their thinking that there was a shift. God does the same thing with us. He does things in the natural so that we can perceive in our spirit, in our thinking, that there's been a shift. And he's now wanting us to respond to the new thing that he's doing that now springs up. Because now we're in a new season. You know, God is, God is, the Bible says, he's taking us from one level of faith to another level of faith. One level of glory to another level of glory. What the capacity that I had at the previous level of glory and faith won't do me any good at the new level. I've got to gain new capacity for the new level. Jesus, Jesus says, you can't put new wine into old wineskins. Because if you do, the wineskin is going to burst and you're going to lose the wine. And so we will try to put the new thing that God is doing into an old wineskin. And then what happens is, we can't grasp it, and it runs out of us. And we're wondering why we're stuck. We're, wonder, we're wondering why we're stuck. Well, because we've got to increase in our faith. We've got to, we've got to open our mind. We've got to understand that there's a shift in season. So that the new wine that he wants to pour into us, the new thing that he wants to do in us, now we have the capacity to handle. Remember in the Old Testament, uh, the, the woman's uh, husband, who was a prophet, died. And the creditors were coming and knocking on the door and saying, hey, give us your sons because you've got these debts. Your husband's dead. We want your sons. So she went to the prophet, and the prophet said, what do you have in your house? She said, I only have a little bit of oil. He says, okay, go, 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 go knock on your neighbor's doors, get as many um, jars as you can. Get as many as you can. And then go back home, close the door, and then pour that oil into all these jars. And then take the oil and go sell them and pay off your debts. Well, she started pouring. And it kept coming until she ran out of jars. When she ran out of jars, the oil stopped. Because there was no more capacity. And I'm saying the oil will stop flowing to us when we don't allow God to increase our capacity. And we're, we're trying to live off an old capacity in a new season, and it's not enough. It, it, it's, it's, it's not enough. And, and, and God is saying, there's been a shift, 
open yourself up. Let me increase your capacity so that I can pour more into you and so that now your level rises. Okay, let me give you an example of this. It's just a pretty common passage. This is Acts 10. We'll start in verse 9. About noon, this is Peter. He's hungry. Yeah, okay. Yeah, this is about Peter and his vision. This is about noon the following day. As they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. Okay, let's skip down to verse 30. Cornelius answered. Cornelius is the Roman centurion who sent the people to get Peter to come to his house so that he could pray for them and speak to them. Now he's back in their house. Peter is back at Cornelius' house. He says, three days ago I was in my house praying at this hour. At three in the afternoon, suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good for you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. What's this story about? Remember the Syrophoenician woman who took something that was, who had access to something that was out of season and brought it into season because Jesus had not died, rose, and, and was um, ascended to heaven. So therefore, she didn't have access to that promise yet. Well, at this point, God is getting ready to open the door to the Gentiles so that they now have access because Jesus has died, he's been raised from the dead, and he's in heaven. So, so, so God is getting ready to open the door, and he's wanting to use Peter as the avenue to open this door and bring salvation to the Gentiles. But before God can use Peter in this shift, there's a shift in season from only the Jews to everyone, a, a, a radical shift. But in order to use Peter to, 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 to be the conduit to make this happen, Peter has to grow. He has to, he has to have a shift in his own thinking. Because his own thinking is an old thinking. He's not tracking with God right now. So he's in this trance. And he's, he has this vision. And, he, and it's so profound that he has it three times. And, 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 and he sees these reptiles and these animals. And the voice is saying, Peter, get up, kill and eat. And Peter says, no, 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 no. These are all unclean. I'm, I can't eat something that's unclean. And Peter says, or, and, 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 the, and the voice says, don't call something that God has made unclean. Now, where is Peter getting this idea that these animals are unclean? From God. 
from the Old Testament. There's, there's a whole book of don't eat this, don't eat that, right? God himself is the one who's saying, look, you can't eat these animals. Now God is saying, don't call something that I said is okay to eat that you don't eat. Why? Because there's a shift in season. And he needs Peter to understand that what God said over there doesn't apply over here because there's a shift. And Peter has to shift in his own thinking about what God is now currently doing. Not only what he wants to, not only what God wants to do in the earth, but what God wants to do in his own life. See, see, here's the thing. Here's the thing that we've got to realize. God wants to use you to transform the world. But in order for you to transform the world, you got to be transformed. Transformation isn't going to happen through you if you yourself aren't given to the transformation. If, you're, if you yourself aren't given to the shift in season. And so we have to allow God to shift us in our thinking, in our understanding, in our lives to be able to be the conduit for the change, the shifting, transformation that he wants to happen through us. And look, here's the reality. We, we don't always like it. We don't always like the change and the shift. And so Peter is so stuck in his way. Look, he's telling God, I'm not doing that, God. I'm not going to get up and kill and eat. I'm not doing... He's telling God this. This is, this, this is, this is how, how, how so, so staunch and so hard he is in his legalism about what he believes. God himself is saying, no, 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 we're not doing that anymore. And Peter says, oh, I'm, I'm not eating that. See how we can be? See how we can be? I'm not doing that. Because we're, we're stuck in our ways. So, so, so God has to give him this vision three times to break his thinking. And his language, you listen to his language. Let me just read it. You. Uh, what verse is this? It says, verse 14. Surely, listen to this. This is him talking to God. Surely not, Lord. So he knows who he's talking to. Surely not, Lord. I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. Surely not, Lord. I'm not doing that. And I wonder if our language keeps us from the shift. The Bible says, from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So there's something in his heart that is not willing to make the shift because he's so stuck in a past revelation. And I believe all revelation is a foundation for new revelation. Revelation builds on itself. And he's stuck in an old revelation. And God says, okay, we'll do it again. Second time. And then, the, then the third time, he's like, okay, we'll do it again. And then in verse 34, he says, now I realize. Because, because God was shifting my thinking. And you Gentiles came to get me to come visit you, 
and, and you want to know all about what God is doing in this shift. Now I realize that the door has been opened. God opens doors and he closes the door. The door where the Jews only were covenantal with, with the Lord was closed. The new door that's opened is where all people who have a desire to know him is available. That door is now open. He recognizes the closed door. He sees the open door, and he makes this statement. Now I realize that God shows no favoritism over Jews or Gentiles. This gives way to Paul, who writes the pretty much half the New Testament because the door had been opened. God uses Peter to open this door. Now, here is the issue. How does God want to use you to open the door to bring blessing to other people? So, so you can understand the shift that he wants to make in the lives of other people. Tony and I were, were talking, and we were talking about this. God is sovereign, right? We know he's sovereign. That means he can do anything he wants, whenever he wants, with whomever he wants, however he wants, because he's sovereign. Right? There was nothing that was going to stop Jesus from being born, him dying, him, him, him being raised from the dead and descending. There was no, there, he's sovereign. But most of the time he doesn't walk in that sovereignty. Because for him to walk in that sovereignty means that he has to override our will. He does it. Scripture shows us that he does it. But he doesn't do it often. He, he doesn't want to override our own will. And here's the interesting thing. This is what we were talking about. People... We'll be out doing whatever we want to do, whatever we want to do. Then all hell breaks loose, and we pray, and we want God to change our situation just like that. And we get mad because he doesn't. Well, why, why doesn't he? And God is saying, look, we where were you calling on me when you were out there doing whatever you wanted to do? You, you weren't calling on me. And now that you're in a, a pickle, you just want me to act like I'm the cosmic bellhop. And God says it doesn't work like that. Yes, I'm sovereign, but I am, I'm also Lord. And you've got to align your life. Yes, I want that thing that's in your life to change, but you got to do some changing. And so now, delay. There's a delay. The delay isn't his denial. The delay is he's trying to grow us up. If he responded to us every time we asked him to respond, we would be spiritual wimps. We'd be spiritual wimps because we wouldn't grow up. We would be spoiled spiritual wimps. And so God is saying, yes, I'm sovereign, but I'm not going to override your own will to come to me, to lay your life down, to surrender, to understand that I'm moving and shifting in times and seasons so that you can align your life with me so that I can work through you to make all the changes that you are actually praying about. Well, that takes too long. Well, it takes as long as you have. If, if, if you don't think it's important and you don't want to give yourself to it, 
It's going to take a while. And God is saying, I got all the time in the world. You don't. And so it behooves us to come into alignment, to understand the shifts of seasons so that we can come to a place where he can pour into us whatever changes, whatever shifts, whatever dynamics that need to happen so that we can be the conduits through which he wants to bless people in the new season. Because it's going to happen through you. The Bible says about Abraham, it says, all the nations on earth will be blessed through you, Abraham. We are the seed of Abraham. So God wants to bless the nations through you. We have to be, be, be able to see the shifts in the seasons so that we can glean what God is doing now. I'll give you this last example, and then I'll stop. Uh, Abraham, since I'm talking about Abraham. God says to Abraham, take your son, your only son, and go sacrifice him on Mount Moriah. The Bible says he got up early the next morning, goes to the mountain, puts Isaac on the slab to sacrifice him. This is what God says to him. He has the knife, getting ready to kill him. God speaks again and says, Abraham, stay your hand. Stay your hand. Don't kill him. Now I know that you are willing to sacrifice your son, your only son. Now, if Abraham wasn't listening to God and didn't see that there was a shift in the season, when he spoke and said, stay your hand, he was like, mm, psh, and kill Isaac. And my, and my concern is that we're killing our Isaacs. Because we're not paying attention to the new season. So the thing that God wants to bring to life, we're killing. Because once upon a time, God was testing us to see what matters more, your dream or me? Your dream or me? Let's see who matters more. Put your dream to death. And, and, and when God tested him and realized, God, you are number one, like, well, you, you don't have to kill your dream. We can keep your dream alive. But we've got to be able to hear him when he says, stay your hand, because there's a shift. And I'm telling you, God is shifting us. He has, he is, and he will continue to ever so slightly or very demonstratively. We have to be able to recognize it. Here's the, here's the easy way to get into a way of recognizing the shift. Spend time with God. Spend time with God. Get in a room, close the door, and just spend time with him so that you sense what he's sensing. So that when you walk away from that time, you realize, oh, here's what God wants to do. Here's what God is saying. Here's because you've been, you're spending time with him. You're calibrating your own heart. You're calibrating your own spirit. You're bringing your own spirit, your own thinking into alignment with his so that when he's when you're not there, you can say, oh, oh, here's a shift in season. It looks like this, 
But here's what it really means. Let's stand.